This episode of Tales from the Lot is sponsored by ShakedownT-Shirts.com. With unique lot style t-shirts, license plate frames, coffee mugs, and all sorts of things for Grateful Dead, Fish, Zappa, Panic, and more. ShakedownT-Shirts.com, where all U.S. orders over $35 ship free. And just for Tales from the Lot listeners, use the code LOT20 for 20% off of any order. That's L-O-T-2-0. Hey, real quick, before we kick off this episode of Tales from the Lot, I've got some exciting news to share with you. I've been working on a project called Summer Tour The Game, inspired by our love of following our favorite bands around. It's a tabletop board game where you chase shows, collect ticket stubs, and relive the magic of live music all from your own tabletop. I'm thrilled to announce that the Kickstarter campaign for Summer Tour The Game is launching on May 12th. If you're a fan of this podcast, then I think you're really going to enjoy this game. You can check out a short video and all the details at summertourthegame.com. So whether you're a seasoned road warrior or a tabletop gaming enthusiast or just looking for a new way to connect with friends, I invite you to check out the campaign and consider supporting it. Every pledge and share and word of encouragement makes a difference. I'd love it if you would help spread the word and make Summer Tour the Game a reality. Thank you, everyone, for listening and being a part of this journey. And now on with the episode. Tales from the Lot, episode 21, you were all part of the band. Tommy Kennedy's here to talk about 9377 in Englishtown, New Jersey, hiking for mental health, and East Coast versus West Coast shows. Let's do it. Hi, welcome to Tales from the Lot. My name is Will. I'm your host, and my guest today is Tommy Kennedy. We're going to talk about 9377 at Raceway Park and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, Tom's coming to us from Texas. How are you doing, Tommy? Good. I'm doing good. 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 Fantastic. Let's just start at the beginning. So, like, are you from Texas originally? No, I'm originally from New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey. Okay. And uh, you grew up there. And and, and, uh, and, uh, so what were you into growing up musically? Um, Bob Dylan. Yeah. (laughs) I was a Dylan head way before I was a Grateful Dead head. Mm -hmm. Um, And then um, after... um, when I went to college, I moved up to Boston, lived in a house, um, an old Victorian with uh, 10 of the guys and one girl. And um, somebody put on, I, I'm i going to say Wake of the Flood. And I was like, holy shit. And that's, um, that's when the bus came by and I got on. Nice. And, uh, and my first show was up in Boston. Gotcha. I, I didn't. I, you mentioned Dylan. I didn't find Dylan really till after I found the dead, but uh, I know I was, I was kind of listening to equal Bob Dylan and, and, and Grateful Dead at the beginning there when I first found it. it was, I mean, two amazing. You, you uh, know, why you mention that, do you know that Bob Dylan requested to become a member of the Grateful Dead? I, I did he not know wanted that. To actually be, yes, he requested to be a member of the Grateful Dead and the, you know, the dead love Dylan, and they got together and talked about it, and they voted on it, and they decided it probably wouldn't be the best thing for the band, so they declined them. <laughs> yeah, when when he toured with the Grateful Dead, mm-hmm. um, I can't remember what, it was back in the yeah, 80s. Like 86 or 7. But, um, yeah, and he really enjoyed playing with the dead. He didn't think he was, but he really did, really. After the first show, then he got into it, and uh, he eventually requested to become a member of the Grateful Dead. Huh. And they seriously considered it and then voted on it and decided it probably wouldn't be the best thing for the band. And although i absolutely certain they made the right decision, I wonder what the dead would have been like with Dylan in there, you know. Um, it would have been interesting, I think. But I'm glad they denied him, you know. Yeah, yeah, that, I agree. That probably would have been the greatest idea, but uh, right. just have him be a permanent opener, make. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe that's, that's the idea, because uh, it is a great mix. And uh, Okay, so um, your first show was in Boston, you said? Yeah, about 1972, I think. Right. And uh, and so how did you end up there? Just, were there some friends going, or, or were you the one who instigated said, listen, you guys got to come see this? Um, no, we were living in a house up in Boston, and like I said, somebody put on Wake of the Flood, 
and we were like, holy crap. And, uh, and then, um, the rest is his history. I heard that and, you know, um, and, you know, it was early 70s. We were doing a lot of experimentation mm -hmm. back then. Right. And, um, and um, back then, people used to, some people used to paint their faces to go to a dead show. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to paint our faces <laughs> to go to the show. And we didn't have tickets, right? So we had to take the trolley. And <sighs> I have my face all white with red lips blue eyeshadow and bl black teardrops coming off my eyes mm -hmm. and we get on the trolley and this one woman just burst out laughing and we're <laughs> like what's so funny they're like you guys <laughs> we're, like, <laughs> we're going to a dead show you know right um, the circus is in town we, we, yeah we <laughs> got um tickets and we got in so it was great nice that's awesome and then uh, so so those those folks did you just once once you saw that did that same group just keep on seeing shows after that? No, um, I was only up there for about a year. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, I actually left, went back down to Jersey and um, my good friend Pete and I started going to the shows mm -hmm. and we went to many, many, many shows, you know, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. how I really, you know, really got into them right yeah it's hard not to it's when when they come that often i mean when they were toured they just toured forever i mean which is kind of a blessing and a curse i guess but uh it was it was easy to see them because they were just always coming around y even in the you 90s know, people say yeah people say 187 shows what did you follow them around the country i was like no new york you had 10 shows at the garden the nassau coliseum new jersey um then I wound up moving to um, California, mm -hmm. and so we have Irvine shows, the Kaiser, the Coliseum. Um, hell, they play all the time up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next thing you know, I wound up with 187 dead tickets, <laughs> you know, stuff. Wow. You know, wow. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah, um, I mean, and at that time, too, in those locations, you're seeing – some of the uh, the all time classic shows. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I talked about it at the beginning. Let's talk about this English Town, New Jersey show, for instance. So uh, the English Town was my brother, who is not a deadhead. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't even smoke pot or anything. He was totally straight. Um, my friend Pete and another friend of mine, um, uh, JC, was his name, and. Uh, so we got there real early to get a good spot, and mm -hmm. we tried to bring an ice chest in. We had a big ice chest. They wouldn't let us in because we had beer. So we went back, rearranged the ice chest to hide the beer, went back in through the same guy, right next to the guy. There was another guy, and he goes, I need to look in the ice chest. I opened it up, and I pulled the ice to the side where I knew there was no beer, and I said, he already got us. And he, he looked over to the guy. He goes, they're good. I already checked them. So we got in with almost two cases of beer and um, and about a fifth of vodka and two <laughs> half gallons of orange juice. So we were sad. <laughs> um, we could have we sold a can of beer for $10 in there. It was like, of course, we didn't. But um it was really, really good. Um, it was nice to have that. Yeah, and, sure. <laughs> and That's then awesome. we also had um, what was called at the time Blue Barrel. I don't know if you know what that was, but it was an LSD. Um, and it was tiny little blue barrel. So all of us, except for my brother, we did the Blue Barrel. And... Um, and the show was actually going to be uh, Marshall Tucker, um, New Riders, mm -hmm. and The Dead. And so we got there real early. So we were pretty close. And um, I remember them turning on a hose because it was really hot that day. They turned a hose on for people to cool off. Um, well, as the day progressed, that hose turned into a huge, huge mud pit. <laughs> mm, it was... Yeah. People were playing in the mud. It was, uh, 
It, it was crazy. <laughs> and so my brother was drinking the, the screwdrivers. And, of course, we were having some and some beers also. But uh-huh. with the LSD, um, you can tend to drink a lot more because uh, it's hard to override the LSD. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's... Next thing you know, I'm looking at my brother, and he is, like, looking like he's dying to me. He's <laughs> laying down. It's not. So I looked at him. I said, Kevin, you look really, really bad to me. I said, do I need you to take you to the infirmary? And he looks at me. He goes, no, I'm just drunk out of my mind. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. Um, you know, because when you're that high, you can't tell, you know. <laughs> And you never know what somebody put it into, into his drink, you know. Yeah, that's, that's true too. You know, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, he was fine, and um, nice. and um, it it was an amazing show. And in fact, afterwards, the album, the, the there was a bootleg box set album, um, vinyl, um, and I bought it because the show was so good, and I had that vinyl i always bought um bootleg albums because i was like they're not going to play forever and i want to listen to them for the rest of my life little did i know i didn't need to be (laughs) taking shows um right um yeah it was um an amazing amazing show um yeah i i listened to it actually but i i I realized it was what tix picks 15 i think it is uh really crisp copy that you can stream anywhere so yeah. um, this afternoon i've been listening to that whole show and uh, it is i mean it's like just it's just so much energy and uh so i guess it's the first one back so mickey hart had been in a car accident yeah and uh so they'd taken a little time off this was the first one back and uh, and you could tell i mean there there were some flubs here and there but the energy that they were going at everything was so amazing like the, the estimated on there is so good yes and yeah. uh, really the whole thing is yeah so definitely recommended listening there. Years ago, I went to a festival in Pennsylvania, and the new uh, the Marshall Tucker Band was there, and I was like mm-hmm. right up front, and he's like, you know, last time we were in this part of the country was 1978 in English Town. I looked up at him and I said, no, 77. I said, I was there and you were there. It was 77. He laughed. He goes, well, we were pretty high. I was like, so late, <laughs> but we can remember when it was. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we know what year it was. Yeah. Like, we, get, we get that, that close. <laughs> That's great. So uh, the new writers play first and then Marshall Tucker and then the dead that day? Um, no, it was Marshall Tucker first, then the new writers. Mm-hmm. And if my memory serves me well, I think Jerry – may have played pedal steel with the nerps um that was going to be my next question actually i think i'm pretty sure he did you know when you go to that many shows um yeah. it's hard to remember but i'm pretty sure he was playing pedal steel at the um we'd have to look at dick's pick the uh to see if he was but i i, I think he was yeah yeah, yeah. cool so, uh, you know, you mentioned you lived in California for a while. And, and, and uh, so what are some of the standout ones that, that you went to? Well, my favorite venue to see them in, and I saw the dead there once, but I saw Jerry there a few times, is the Kaiser Auditorium. And on okay. one of Jerry's album, there's a picture of the Kaiser and the people in the crowd. Um, it was a great, great venue. It was small. They had a bar downstairs. They pumped the music into the bar. So when you wanted to go get a beer, you could still hear the band. Um, Mm -hmm. And um, that's great. That was really great. And uh, uh, I've been to a New Year's show. That was um, really funny. And I remember going into the show, and there were people standing there with $100 bills for a ticket. And I was like, Oh my God! Somebody would pay a hundred dollars, and now I wish I could pay a hundred dollars. Yeah, I, I gladly pay a hundred dollars for that. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, <laughs> but at that time, a hundred dollars for a concert was unheard of. You know. Um, yeah, so that yeah was no good. doubt. And also, uh, Irvine was um, 
Mm -hmm. great place to see the dead. And I lived really close to Irvine. Um, So that was, I considered them playing in my backyard when they played Irvine. Um, Right. So that was like, that was like early mid eighties when you were living there then? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I was in San Diego to about um, 19, from 1980 to about 91, went back to Jersey for a couple of years then went back to San Diego, um, then went back to Jersey, you know. So I've seen the East Coast shows and the West Coast shows, and there's a huge difference between an East Coast show and a West Coast show. You see the dead in Madison Square Garden. Everybody is singing every word, you know, standing up. The first show I saw in... um, California. Everybody was sitting down and listening to it and I'm like, what the hell? (laughs) Um, It was really bizarre. You know, after like a while, um, you know, years later, people were starting to really totally enjoy the shows better. In the Bay Area, they always did, but down in San Diego, Mm -hmm. it was like, it was weird. You know, and then um, there was another. <laughs> it was weird. <laughs> there was another interesting show at Giant Stadium in New Jersey, where when I got home, mm-hmm. um, my parents said, "What did you do today?" I said, well, "I was at the Dead Show at, at the Meadowlands," and they're like, "Well, we were at a concert at the Meadowlands." I was like, "Well, you weren't at the Dead Show." And my mom was like, no, those people are disgusting. We were seeing Bobby. <laughs> I was like, oh, joy. Damn, I missed that one. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Bobby Vinton. Yeah. High up on the list. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but it was. Uh, oh, that's hilarious. It was funny. My dad was a drummer. I always wish we could have taken him to see the dead, you know, because mm-hmm. at that time, having two drummers was. And my father's generation never heard of, you know, and uh, my dad would not have liked the music, but he would have appreciated his drums, you know. Um, Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, people say that, but I mean, I get that sometimes it gets a little extended, but but for the most part, I mean, it's Americana. I mean, there's country in there, there's blues in there. I feel like, you know, unless you're like a, I only listen to like, hard bop or something yeah <laughs> uh then you know otherwise i feel like you're gonna find something redeemable about it you know well you know i never went to the bathroom during space i didn't want to miss it mm-hmm. at all um right. because um if you really pay attention to what they're doing there's a method it's not just noise it, it's there's a method there's actually a beat I agree. to it and um you, you, if you really pay attention, it's very, very cool. Um, yeah, as a drummer myself, uh, it, I was always pretty inspired by the as the by the drum segment, indeed. Like, uh, and and I remember going at my first show. Uh, I'd listened to some random dad. I didn't really like it, but my my friend sort of forced me to go, and, and obviously I loved it from the first note of half step, but. Uh, but by the time drums ran, came around, I didn't. I wasn't expecting. I didn't know what it was. Didn't know that was going to happen. It was just like, what? Yeah. A whole twenty minutes of just yeah. drums, and, and I was blown away by it. So, yeah, that was one of the favorite parts. Now, I will admit to going to the restroom a couple of times through during way to go home, though. Well, <laughs> my bathroom was one more Saturday night because I think they played that every single Saturday night, and I was like, God, you know. Especially if they yeah. did it for an encore, I was like, "Well, now I can beat the traffic." <laughs> you know, I've heard that song so many times. Oh, yeah, yeah. If it's an encore, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. If it's an encore, it's time to go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if not, then you know, maybe you'll get something good there. <laughs> so you saw a hundred and how many shows did you say? One hundred and eighty-seven, give or take one or two. Right around 100. Yeah, yeah, close enough. But that's yeah. And that's it's funny awesome. because people, yeah, that, I mean, think I was like touring and stuff. I was like, no, I, 187. I was like a novice, <laughs> you know. Um, people <laughs> have seen them 500 times, you know, and more, 
you know. Right. And, and, and you know, and you were seeing them when they still had uh, a while to go. So there's, there was plenty of years of, of dead available to you really. And uh, so that's the big difference. I mean, there was, I mean, like you said, they were touring all the time and, and over the years they just add up. I mean, uh, I'm sort of the same way with fish. I don't, I don't follow them around, but I steadily see my number rising and rising and rising. Just right. I live next to Dick's. I'm a short flight from Vegas. And so it just goes up and up because they play those places a lot. You know? What I um, found amazing as I look back at all this is I got to witness their progression from the early 70s um, and even tapes from the 60s when they were really raw um, and how they progressed into being, right. um, I, I hate to say professional, but more of a professional um sound to them and uh it was really right. interesting seeing their progression all along you know um yeah no doubt i mean i was thinking of that today listening to that english town show that you know just how kind of clangy changy the guitars yeah. are it's just re all really loose and and not you know where you get to like where they're in Tight. mid late 80s and 90s where it's almost like a studio sound coming yes. out of the, the speakers because it's so clean yeah and just i mean really clean sound by the end which was, was good and you know they were ahead of their time when it came to all that stuff so but yeah there's definitely a progression from from when donna uh, and and keith were there yeah up through the, to when brent to brent came on i feel like there was kind of a like right after that it really started getting a lot cleaner I think, it did uh, sound wise yeah, yeah. um he really, really, truly added to the band big time. Um, yeah. It was a really, really good choice um, to, to bring him on. Um, unfortunately, he succumbed to the demons, but um, he was really, really good for the band, I think. Okay, so... Um you're involved with a nonprofit, also, is that right? Correct. And and that's called Hike for Mental Health. Correct. Yep. Tell me tell me about that. We started this um, about twelve years ago. Um, we were I was at a Holiday Inn um, right near where I lived, having dinner. A girl walked in. She sat down, ordered a hamburger. I never saw a woman eat a hamburger like that in my life. I looked at her and I said, that burger never had a chance. She goes, I've been fantasizing about it for three months. I've been in China eating rice. And uh, so she was there on business. I lived right next door. Then she introduced me to another guy, Leo, who um, was also staying at the Holiday Inn. And we would go out and do some hikes and stuff. Nancy moved back to Texas. And Leo and I were still in Jersey, and we did some hiking, and we were having dinner, and we were like, wouldn't it be good to do something to give back? And Leo said, well, let's see. Um, I said, something to do with hiking. He goes, let's see, why do we hike? I immediately said, we hike for mental health. We feel so much better after hiking. And originally, he didn't like the name. He goes, that's really a long name. I said, yeah, but it says exactly what we do. And so that's when it was conceived. It was born about six weeks later. And we raise, um, we're all volunteer. Nobody gets a salary. Um, all the donations, 100% of the donations go to the cause. We even pay the processing fee out of our own pockets um, for credit cards. Um, and like I said, nobody gets a salary or anything like that. And 80% we give goes to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation in New York. They give $50,000 grants, grants to scientists that are on the cutting edge of a breakthrough but have not been funded yet. Once they get funded, it's a lot easier for them to get funded again. We give 10% to the Appalachian Trail and 10% to the Pacific Crest Trail. And uh, we're on our 12th year. Last year, we gave a check for $15,000. And our checks for the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation are 
always over fifty thousand dollars. Sometimes it can be as high as eighty thousand. Wow. Uh, so, <clears throat> what type of events and, and what kind of things do you guys organize, and how does it all? We have hikes going on all over the country. Anybody can volunteer to lead um, a hike for us. Um, if they Google hike for mental health, we come right up. Um, one of our premier events is we do a hike up Mount Washington in New Hampshire every year. We already have about over 100 people signed up for that one already this year. That one we usually raise over $25,000. That's a lot of fun. Um, and this year we're incorporating the COG so people can sign up to take the COG up if they don't feel like hiking up the mountain. Um, so it's it's just a, a really good, fun event, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I'm here in Colorado, so, uh, you know, I take a hike here and there around the state and so I feel like 200% better every time. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. Time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. just getting some air, getting uh, taking some, you know, seeing some mm -hmm. wildlife and and and, and whatever. Uh, you know, by the time I'm done, I'm I'm just feeling great. Yeah, uh, I time. did the 1100 mile Florida Trail in 2015, and uh -huh. uh, that took 10 weeks. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's impressive. Yeah. That's impressive. Half that trail is underwater, so you're. If feet start to get dry, you know you're heading back into water, you know. Yeah, that sounds like there might be an element of danger there, too, in Florida and, and shallow waters. I stopped counting alligators at 100, <laughs> and that was only two weeks into the trail. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, snakes and goddamn the mosquitoes are unbelievable, oh, yeah. you know. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got, some, you got some mosquitoes in Texas, though, too, so. Yeah, we do. <laughs> that's a great. That's a great thing. And uh, yeah, do you know of anything going on here in Colorado? Um, not at the moment. Um, but if you go on our website, you can see all our hikes, where they are, you know, and things like that. You can sign up and do it. Um, all our events are non-stigma events. So we tell people if you want to talk, if you have a mental illness. One in four people suffer from some form of mental illness. If you want to talk about it, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. We look at it like you have a cold. We don't look at it like there's no stigma involved, you know. Right. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid, there was a stigma about breast cancer. Women didn't talk about it. They died a painful death. They were embarrassed about it. Now we're save the tatas, you know. Yeah. If we can do the same thing for mental illness, more people will seek help and we'll have less people taking their lives, you know. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, yeah, that's a great cause. So thanks for that. All right. Amazing work. So, all right. So at the end, I'd like to wrap up with recommendations. Uh, I know deadheads are smart, interesting people who like cool stuff. So, uh, is there a, a book or an album or a movie or something that's really struck you lately? Well, the um, this is an old book. It's, I'm sure, out of print, but you can still find it. It's the Rolling Stone interview of Jerry. And it was done probably very early 70s. And it's it's a great book. It's a paper paperback and and Jerry is really open and candid it's just a really really good interview mm -hmm. uh, I should have grabbed it just to show you what the cover looks like but this is also very cool um, because I can't tell you how many times um, the words I heard were not the words being sung <laughs> and uh, and this corrects all that you can get all the words and there's linear notes about when the song was written and you know all kinds of good information on that awesome too. that's the, the the annotated grateful dead lyric book is that right yes yeah the complete annotated uh, grateful dead lyrics yeah no, um right. it's a really really good book um and um you know after Jerry passed, I went, I saw the dead, I saw the other ones, 
Um, what was the other incantation they had? The further. Further. And it was good music. I mean, there's no doubt they were mm -hmm. all talented. But I couldn't get over the listening to them, and they'd be playing a Jerry song, and I'd be like, yeah, but Jerry would be going like, da, 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 you know, and I right. just couldn't get over it. So I stopped seeing them, you know. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I haven't seen a whole lot of stuff either. I mean, I saw the first Further Tour. And, you know, so one of the, one of the offshoots that I was really impressed with was the Mickey Hart Band uh, that was touring a few years ago with, with David yeah. Schools from Widespread Panic on bass. Uh, that was a, a group that I was really impressed with because they were doing they were doing something different. I felt like they were they were making new music, essentially. Um, you know, but if you, but if you look at what Bobby's doing with Dead and Company, that's cool. And I'm glad that he's keeping it alive. I, I don't want to say anything bad about that because it needs to be kept alive. But he had that album uh, called Blue Mountain uh, of like folk songs and, and Americana and stuff that I thought was fantastic. And that was a really good lane for him to maybe stick with. Uh, are you familiar with that album, Blue Mountain? That I am did? not. I will no. be now. Um... Yeah, check it out. I mean, it's it's just like uh, it's all new music and it's very uh, folky and Americana and like it felt a lot like what Johnny Cash was sort of doing sort of at the end of his life with, the, with right. the Rick Rubin or whoever was, uh, I think that's who was producing it. Yeah. Um, Rick, sort of gothic sounding Americana. I don't know, but uh, it was, I thought it was a good lane for him. He sat, his voice really suited the music. Wow. And, uh, but you know, he makes a lot of money with dead and company. So there, there's something to be said. For that. Yeah. No <laughs> doubt. They're making amazing money. From the makers of the Big Bong Theory and How I Met Your Dealer comes the hilarious new sitcom, Two Hippies and a Cop. Lighting up your Thursday nights this fall on TFTL-TV. Lenny and Wu are two free-spirited hippies living the high life with their love of concerts and herbal remedies. Hey, Lenny, wasn't that show so good last night? Totally epic, man. I'm pretty sure I left my body somewhere in the middle of that second set. Oh, so that's where you went. I thought you went to the restroom. <laughs> but here's the twist. Their new roommate is none other than Cletus Strait, an Indiana State cop. All right, listen up, you two. No more jam sessions past midnight, and keep the incense away from the smoke detector. <laughs> Cue the chaos, the mix-ups and the side-splitting shenanigans as these three unlikely roommates navigate their way through life, love, and the pursuit of peace and understanding. Two hippies and a cop. Because sometimes, the best friendships are the ones you least expect. Don't miss it. Thursdays at 8 p.m. only on TFTL-TV. I met Phil one time, and uh, I said to him, what do, what do I say to Phil Lesh except thank you, thank you, thank you? I said, you know, you really made us feel like we were part of the band. He got up, came around the table, and hugged me, and he said, you guys were part of the band. We played off you just like you played off us. He goes, you, were, you guys were absolutely part of the band. And... Uh, and that was kind of cool, you know, because I've yeah. had dreams where I'm up on the stage, you know, off the side while they're performing and stuff. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, and I felt that, too. I mean, even the limited, <laughs> limited time I was able to see him, uh, there was a give and take of energy. And uh, yeah. it, you, you could tell, I mean, uh, from, you know, a low energy show to a high energy show and, and the, the difference in the crowd. You yeah. Could see it. No doubt. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is amazing. And the Jerry shows, I saw Jerry in Chula Vista, California, just before he went into that coma. Um, it was like the day or two before he went into the coma. And I was there with a bunch of my friends. I said, all right, we got to go. And they're like, Can you say that? He, he's not going to come on for about 45 minutes after the show. I said, no, 
Jerry comes on immediately. If it's an eight o'clock show, at eight o'clock he's walking out on the stage. They didn't oh, really. Me. Oh yeah, Jerry was never late. Always right on time. The show starts at eight. He walks out on the stage at eight o'clock. I did not um, know that. Yeah, and he did one of my favorite songs, Shining Star. And I remember being in the crowd, and as soon as he hit the first note, I yelled out, Shining Star. And the guy about 12 rows down looks up at me and goes, Oh my God, that's a good call, <laughs> you know. And, <laughs> but what happened was Jerry, and I can't find a tape of it, but Jerry got stuck in the song. And it went on and on and on. It was like, to the point, this is my favorite Jerry song. I was like, Jerry, come on. <laughs> you know, end it. And so I think he was like maybe getting a little spacey from, because he went right into a coma. I think it was the next day or the day after, you know. Mm-hmm. But yeah. um, I, I remember going, what the hell's wrong with him? Why Why can't he end the song, you know? Um, it was weird, you know? Yeah. But yeah. he influenced my life um, as much as my father did, to be honest with you. And um, I wouldn't be the same person I am now if it were not from, obviously, my father, but also the Grateful Dead, you know? What was sort of your favorite era? Did you prefer the Keith, the Donna, or the, the Keith and Donna era versus the Brent era versus the, uh, the Vince era? Um, Brent, by far. Um, yeah. You know, Keith, yeah. um, by the time I really started seeing uh, the, the dead, Keith was um, not very vibrant. And, you know, Donna... Um, we loved Donna in the band. We loved seeing her. We're like, is she going to be dressed up or is she going to be wearing jeans or what? You know, um, right. a voice, in all honesty, most times was fine. But every now and then, her voice just sucked, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, um, Brent came in and did absolutely wonderful, wonderful job. The unfortunate thing was he was there for like 10 years and everybody was calling him the the new guy, you know. Yeah, and still. Bobby <laughs> mentioned that. He goes, yeah, he's been with us for 10 years and they all still call him the new guy, you know. <laughs> um, he he was really, really um, very talented, you know. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I, 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 didn't, I didn't get a chance to see him live. I came on a couple of years or a year later. Uh, but... Well. Uh, definitely, he was my favorite. As far I mean, just I just love his voice. I mean, the, the, yeah. the tone that he added to, to the harmonies and and just his voice was so good and, and a good. Mix and the passion, there. you know, he sung with passion. You know, yeah. he played with yeah. passion, sang with passion. He yes. he was passionate. There's no doubt yeah. about it. One of my favorite things is watching that downhill from here video, where with just him and Jerry. Uh, grinning so hard at each other, you know, just pushing each other, to, to, you know, on and uh, I love that. That is so cool. I, I yeah, hope I everybody picks up on that. It's not like just you and I. Um, yeah, because that was so cool. You could just see them playing with each other, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. You know, yeah, you could you could see the love and the and everything yeah. between them right there. It was it was amazing. Yeah, it was it was great. And anytime mm-hmm. Bobby could remember the words to truck, and that was always a positive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a little mm-hmm. Awesome. All right, Tom, Tommy Kennedy, thank you so much for, for, for joining me here and, and telling your stories. And, and uh, it was sure great to, to talk to you and to meet you today. All right. Thank you very much also. Hey, now, do you have a great story about a Grateful Dead show you were at? I'd love to hear it and maybe have you on the podcast. Send me an email at will at talesfromthelot.org and let me know what show you would like to talk about and what made it so special to you.